I just wanted to call and let you guys know that, yep, y'all did it again. Y'all are acting like y'all are Hubert Shiva load, and I do mean that in the nicest way possible because I say it with love. <laughs> I say it with love in my heart, and we love you for it. Welcome to Damn It, Jim, the podcast. A fun and fascinating look at the Star Trek original series movies. My name is Dana Smith, and I am once again happy to be the captain who's going to guide us through this final film from the original series crew. And as always, I'm joined by your favorite Supreme Vice Admiral of Levity, Dan Calzaretta. Good evening, Dan. Wait, I'm levitating? Is that what's happening now? <laughs> I, I actually meant to say brevity, but that was re- not right. So <laughs> <laughs> That would not be a good description of me, I don't think. <laughs> so how are you doing? You uh, you would took off to the to Oregon again or someplace to go to a wedding. You had your whole family. That's why we got the hate mail for not being on last week. And playing Spock's brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to a wedding. One of my nephews who lives in Portland got married up near Mount Hood. It was beautiful, and they had free beer. So you were able to study while you were there for your uh, exam that's coming up, right? That's exactly right. I was studying many times. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? How are things going for you? Oh, pretty good. We had a nice weekend. Uh, football is starting again, so I was happy. Got to see some preseason football. Just been working a lot and doing the same old stuff. Now we're back at it again to, uh, like I said, finish out the Star Trek original series cast movies. Yeah. Well, let's let's maybe jump into those listener comments. Did get an email from NJ Esperantist. And he wrote about the final frontier. I cannot think of any redeeming quality of this film, (laughs) except for the fact that you two have given it an enjoyable, humorous review. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I feel the pain of anyone whom had to watch this more than once. (laughs) Bastard. Not you. Him. (laughs) To sum up, this film belongs in the Schmitter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good callback yeah i totally agree with him on that yeah me too he also said about our encore episode for spock's brain brain and brain whom is brain <laughs> <laughs> dana when is this gonna stop and whom will stop it <laughs> See, now I'm doing it to myself. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the way it goes. Dance come around. It's come full circle now. So. <laughs> God, I really do wish that English professor would get back to us. <laughs> okay, uh, Dan also got an email from GA Philly fan who also commented on The Final Frontier. It's possible that William Shatner is a great director. Mm, I don't know about that. Hmm. So uh, he says, but we'll never know. No one is polishing this turd. (laughs) (laughs) If season three were a movie, it would would be this. The plot, the dialogue, the effects, it can hardly be called special, all made this the worst track in recorded history. It's a testament to your ability to make even the worst episodes funny that allowed me to enjoy this review. Well, thanks a lot, GA Philly fan. That's, uh, That's an awesome comment. Yeah, that was great. So, Dan, do you have any phone calls this week? Yeah, Dana, we got several. We received a call from Robert from Nevada. Dana, is it Nevada or Nevada? Because if I don't get it right, he's not calling again. (laughs) (laughs) I think if you're from outside the state, it's Nevada. And if you're inside the state, it's Nevada. Okay, that clears it up. (laughs) So Robert from Nevada called, and (laughs) here's what he had to say. I've listened to most of your podcasts. I really like them. I hope you guys continue to uh, podcast. You have a knack for bringing out the gaps in the production in a thoroughly entertaining way. And let me just uh, request, please, please, please include Generations in your movie review. After all, Shatner is in it, even though it's uh, sort of a next generation movie. Please include it. Anyway, keep up the good work. Hope you guys uh, have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye. That's a great idea, Dan. We've kind of discussed that briefly, but uh, William Shatner's in that there are other original series crew members in it briefly. Might have to take a look at that. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. We also got a call from Roxy Ray, and here's what she had to say. I just had to call and thank y'all for taking one for the team. I remembered this movie being really bad, but I had forgotten it how bad it was, and the fact that y'all sat through it and actually had me laugh my full head off 
over it. Y'all are great humanitarians. Y'all need to be nominated for something like the Nobel Peace Prize or something. Just thank you so much. And I hope that y'all have a really pleasant week. Well, Dana, I was happy to take one for the team. What what did you take? You know, we we took one for the team by watching the movie and reviewing it. You've already for, you've already forgotten the film. <laughs> what do they call that when you your mind just like shuts it away? You know, alcoholism. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I, th- I think it's like selective memory. Isn't that what they call it? Yeah, yeah. I've got a lot of selective memory. All right, Dana, that's all I've got for this week. Okay, great. And uh, as always, thanks for writing and calling. Really appreciate the phone calls. Any way you want to communicate with us is all right with us. So uh, please keep it up. We look forward to hearing from you. You know what I would love, Dana, is a carrier pigeon to show up at my house. Wow. Wouldn't that be cool? Guy I work with raises pigeons for racing. Oh, yeah. I've heard about that. Yeah. And he was saying that uh, he has, he communicates with his cousin or somebody to, and they send pigeons back and forth with notes. Now, to, to race pigeons, like you got to build a really small car for them to fit in, right? It's a jet. Yeah. They, they use, pigeons use jets. Yeah. It's actually rockets. It's one of those ones you, you attach the uh, pigeon to, and then you light the rocket. <laughs> 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 is that like part of the firework display or what, what is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the way that, you know, the way pigeons shit just normally, having one explode, I would think would be a freaking disaster. Dan, let's get into Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. I'm excited about this one, Dana. So, Dan, we start off with a massive explosion. Yeah. Then we go to uh, Captain Sulu on the bridge of the Excelsior as he's having his tea, and the whole ship gets rocked by a shockwave. So we learn that the explosion was from Praxis, which is Klingon's main energy production facility. And we see Praxis blown to pieces. And Dana, that has to be a reference to Chernobyl, right? Oh, yeah. That's, there's a lot through here that will remind us of Chernobyl. And just as a little education piece, because Dana, you know, people learn a lot of stuff on this podcast. Chernobyl was a nuclear accident that took place... Actually, it was in Ukraine, but was part of the Soviet Union at the time. It took place in 1986. Yeah, it's actually the uh, worst uh, nuclear reactor accident in the uh, history of our nuclear age. That's true. Yeah, I mean, they tried their hardest at Three Mile Island, Dana, but they just couldn't quite pull it off. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, Americans are lazy. So just... <laughs> Those Russians went all for it, man. That's just... <laughs> you know, that still is a problem. I mean, it's oh, still yeah. melting down in the inside of that thing. Oh, yeah. I saw a thing where they sent uh, robots inside. Yeah. And uh, the robots would get like so far and the radiation was so strong, it'd knock out the batteries on the robots. Yeah. It was just crazy. Yeah. They said like there's like hot zones inside that place. That's good. Did you see the movie or the series on Max or HBO? I did. Yeah, it was really good. I liked it. Man, I, I I was thinking about watching it again. Yeah, it's based on a book, I think, called Midnight at Chernobyl, or I don't don't remember exactly what the name is now. Yeah. But it was good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, they did a great job. It's uh, really amazing. So uh, then we see Lieutenant Rand is on the bridge, and she's at the communication station, and a Klingon transmission comes across, and it's just like Russia in the day comes across and says, there's been an incident on Praxis, but everything is under control. And uh, Rand asks Sulu, should we report this? And Sulu says, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was was great. And I was kind of surprised that was Rand's response. So. Yeah. So we go to San Francisco and we see we're at Starfleet headquarters. We see the... Uh, crew from the enterprise coming in they're talking about their other interests scotty says something about he's got a new boat and uhura says something about she's got to do some training for like she's teaching a class so they've all been apart and they and they, this is the first time they've seen each other in a while i mean that's what's being indicated to us right yeah exactly and then the cnc comes in i've worked with cncs before but usually it's a, a machine <laughs> <laughs> I, what does it stand for because it's it's c dash in dash c so it's something in command like the commander in command but it, for the machine what does it stand for dana a cnc machine i used to know this it's computer aided choreography or something you know so. <laughs> well so it's a, a machine about dancing that that's what it is computer numerical control huh i knew that so uh 
He comes in and says, the Klingon Empire has 50 years of life left. And he says, though, He'll turn it over to the Federation Special Envoy. And somebody walks by Kirk and McCoy, and you see Kirk and McCoy kind of look kind of startled by whoever's walking by them. We see it's Spock. And he says, two months ago, the moon of Praxis exploded. They cannot afford to combat the situation. Therefore, I have been in contact with the Klingon Chancellor, and we are beginning negotiations at once. So, Dana, once again, a total reference to the former Soviet Union. Yeah, exactly. In the intelligence world, this is one of the things that was reported to the U.S. government was that maybe 50 years the Soviet Union has, and we better help manage that collapse. Otherwise, who knows who takes over? It could be, you know, a wackadoodle. Yeah. It actually happened. So uh, Admiral Cartwright is sitting there, and he says, now is the time to bring the Klingons to their knees, and therefore put us in a better position to negotiate on our terms. And Kirk agrees, saying the Klingons have never been trustworthy. So Spock says it is imperative that they act, and Chancellor Gorkin, not Gorkin, Gorkin. He did kind of look like a big pickle, actually. <laughs> did he? Yeah, I, I kind of thought so too. Yeah. <laughs> he says he will come to Earth to negotiate. And the CNC says the Enterprise will pick up Gorkin, and you, Captain Kirk, will be our first olive branch. Kirk just looks dismayed. And Spock says there's an old Vulcan proverb only Nixon could go to China. And Kirk again says, don't believe him, don't trust him. Yeah. And Spock says they are dying. And Kirk responds, let them die. So uh, next we see Kirk enter the bridge of the Enterprise, and he's followed by Spock and McCoy and like half the rest of the crew. And we see a Vulcan woman stand at attention. And then Kirk stood at attention. We learn this is Lieutenant Valeris. Kirk orders that they leave space dock, and so they head out. In Kirk's quarters, we get a captain's log as he sets down a picture of David, and he says, I can never forgive them for the death of my boy. So Dana, I, I have a question. This is not about the story, but it's about like the making of the film so they have the picture of the guy who played kirk's son because kirk's looking at the picture it's on his desk right yeah does that guy get paid for that no he wouldn't get paid anything if they used his voice or they i mean maybe they cut him a check for like 50 bucks or something but... <laughs> so uh valeris comes in and says they are nearing the rendezvous point so dana she just walks into his room yep right in the middle of him dropping a captain's log <laughs> Yep, out there in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and he even says something like, don't don't you knock? Yeah, yeah. And uh, and she's just like, oh, I didn't think it, you'd mind. You know, <laughs> I see women coming and going from here all the time. So. <laughs> yeah, it was weird, though. I mean, you would think the captain's quarters, you, you would have to, like, ring a doorbell or something. Yeah, because there's probably, like, classified information in there. So next we see Spock in his room, and he's, like, wearing a robe and... A wizard's uniform, Dana. It looked like a freaking wizard's uniform. Yeah, and and he's making a cocktail. And he's like, drops a little pellet into it. I think he's doing a Cosby. Yeah. Last shot for the Cosby right now. This is it. <laughs> yeah. This is the last chance he's going to get. So Valeris is there. So Spock takes the drink to her, and then she drinks from it. I could not get beyond the cup. I mean, it looked like a water bong, that he was like handing her a water bong. <laughs> I wouldn't be taking that drink from him. No, God, no. Yeah, just like Cosby. Yeah. Just then, they hear that a Klingon ship is approaching. Chekhov asks if they should raise shields, and Kirk says, I've never been this close. And then he orders they bring the ship alongside the Klingon ship. They open communications. Kirk offers for them to join them for dinner. And Chekhov sits down in his chair and says, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> it was a good line. Later on... The Klingons beam aboard. The Klingon Chancellor introduces his staff, which includes General Chang. He's this bald-headed dude with an eye patch that appears to be riveted to his head. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's weird. He's got like three looks like rivets in it. Yeah, so. yeah. Chang goes to Kirk and says, I've always wanted to meet you, Captain Kirk. And Kirk says, I'm not sure how to take that. <laughs> so uh, next we go to the dinner where the Klingons don't know what to make of the napkins they have at the table. They're all like looking at him like, you know, what am I supposed to do this? Do I eat it? I know. It was, it was funny. That part was funny. Chancellor Gorkin says, I offer a toast to the undiscovered country, the future. And Spock says, Hamlet. 
Act Three, Scene One, and Gorkin says, "You have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Cleon." <laughs> and Chang goes, "Bak kukukuku," which means "to be or not to be." <laughs> <laughs> and we see Kirk is slamming the Romulan ale, <laughs> and so the dinner gets taken off, and it's a bit awkward at best. Later, Gorkin asks Kirk, "says You don't trust me, do you?" Then he says. I don't blame you. He says, if there is to be a brave new world, our generation is going to have the hardest time living in it. Then Chang quotes more Shakespeare, and then they get on the transporter and leave. Chekhov says, they have terrible manners. And and also terrible accent. (laughs) So they all go off their separate ways. Everybody's kind of complaining about the Romulan ale. Yeah, because they they were, like you said, they were slamming that stuff. So it's, you know, it's like meeting the in-laws for the first time. In your case, probably every time. No comment. Next, we see Kirk in his quarters, and he's staring at a picture of David. Is he dropping a log again? <laughs> but I mean, like, he's like suddenly so attached to the sun he had for five minutes. Right. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I remember when we played ball. Oh, wait a minute. We never got a chance to do that. <laughs> uh, I remember telling you stories about my younger. Oh, we never had a chance to do that. He didn't even know it was his son. Yeah, that part seemed a little contrived to me as well. But I think the whole point there is that we really have to see how much Kirk hates the Klingons. So uh, as Kirk goes to lie down, Spock hails him to join him on the bridge. On the bridge, Spock tells Kirk that there is a strong surge of neutron radiation. He says it's apparently coming from us. Well, Kirk said, well, that was just me with the captain's log. (laughs) And that Romulan ale just, you know, just goes through me. Do not get on that turbo left I just got off of. We we got a cleaning crew coming in in the morning. (laughs) So just then, the photon torpedo fires and hits the Klingon ship. And the shot looked like it came from the Enterprise. So everyone scrambles to their posts. Then another torpedo fires and hits the Klingon ship again. We see the uh, on board the Klingon ship, we see they have lost gravity. Everyone just kind of like starts floating out of their chairs and stuff. Not only did they lose gravity, apparently time slows down because now they're all in slow motion and their voices, t- they're talking like they're in slow motion. I mean, that doesn't happen in space. You don't talk like they're in slow motion. <laughs> But it was like, we got fired upon. Yeah, Yeah, I did not understand that. No, I didn't either. So back on the Enterprise, Scotty reports they have not fired any photon torpedoes. Wait, what did he say? (laughs) Scotty says, we have not fired any photon torpedoes. (laughs) That was a little bit of check off at the end. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Scotty reports, we have not fired any photon torpedoes. That's, uh, Chekhov's like creeping in. I know, check off it. Hey, by the way, Walter Koenig, anything from him? No, the little bastard. Yeah. Just because uh, just he's like 85 years old, he's afraid, you know, you kick his ass. That's... Dang it. <laughs> All right, well, I know that I asked you that same question two weeks ago. He hadn't gotten to us, so we'll let's keep pushing on that. So just then, two men in kind of like battle gear beam aboard the Klingon ship, and they uh, appear to have magnetic boots because like they seem to be locked to the floor when they walk. Yeah. So they fire and kill one Klingon, and you know they've got and these guys have like helmets on. You can't see their faces. Right. It's all white suits. They fire and kill this one Klingon, and his blood is pink. Yeah, it looked like Pepto Bismol to me. I was gonna say it looks a lot like Pepto Bismol. I think maybe that's what they used. Yeah. The two men continue down the hall and shoot off the arm of one of the Klingons. Then uh, they go in the Chancellor's quarters and shoot him. Yeah. They exit and go to the transporter pads, and we see Klingon blood kind of floating in, and it hits one of the assassin's boots. So we know there's going to be some like evidence now, right? Yeah. And but they could just say it's Pepto Bismol. My stomach was bothering me earlier, you know. So yeah, yeah. I was I was about to you know drop a lieutenant log, and um, <laughs> my stomach was really hurting. Yeah. So thank God we had Pepto Bismol on board the ship. I don't I don't like Pepto Bismol. Yeah, I used to drink that so much when I was a kid. Yeah, that's why I don't like it now because it gives me that memory. I I don't like it either. But I do eat a lot of tums, Dana. I will say that <laughs> I eat a lot of tums. Yeah. Well, I've been there. <laughs> so Chang calls and you could see him on he's like holding on to the ship and he yells at Kirk is have you not a shred of decency in you Kirk we come in peace and you blatantly defy that peace for that 
I shall blow you out of the stars. And Kirk's like dumbfounded and says, we haven't fired. And Spock says, Captain, according to our data banks, we have twice. And so the Klingon ship comes about. Everyone asks if they should raise the shields. And Kirk says, no, finally. And then says, notify them that we surrender. Kirk says he's going over the Klingon ship. And McCoy says he's going as well as they might need a doctor. And Spock's like, well, then why are you going? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Spock goes and kind of like pats Kirk on the shoulder, but we see he like put something on his shoulder. Yeah, it was like he put the kick me sign on him. I mean, come on. <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> Send him over to the Klingon ship and it says in Klingon, kick me. <laughs> you could completely see the thing. It looked like it was, I don't know, a piece of Velcro or something, but it, it yeah. was so obvious. It was black against his red uniform. I remember when I first saw it, I didn't really pick up on that. Maybe others didn't do as well. No, I'm pretty sure everyone probably did. Everybody but me. Right. Okay. <laughs> on the Klingon ship, gravity has been restored. Kirk and McCoy pass by the dead crewman on the way to Gorkin. It seems like there was more dead people than these guys even fired at. Yeah, I think we just didn't see a lot of it, yeah. They get to Gorkin, and McCoy offers to help. Mm, once again, probably probably not a good idea <laughs> there, Dana. And the wound looked really bad. And, like, you know, I mean, there was, like, flesh kind of, like, torn up in his chest and stuff. He was and gurgling out some liquid, like yeah. some Pepto Bismol. Yeah. Gorkin goes into a rest, dies basically. And McCoy climbs up on the table and does CPR. Gorkin comes around and he pulls Kirk down to him and he says, Don't let it end this way, Captain. And then he dies. That's what you get for having McCoy try to help you out. Because <laughs> really it was just a, a tiny flesh wound. So Chang arrests Kirk and McCoy for assassinating the Chancellor. So next we see the a Klingon ambassador talking to the Federation president. The Klingon ambassador says Kirk and McCoy will stand trial for the assassination. Finally, the president says something uh, that I think should be echoed out to our current former president. He says uh, he will comply as this president is not above the law. Yeah, they, they have a different Supreme Court in the future, Dana. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the president, though, I got, I got something to say about the president there. His hair. Okay. Beautiful. It's beautiful, Dan. It's beautiful. That hair and that mustache. I mean, he looked like, to me, like a country singer from the 1970s, you know, where they get that long, flowing hair going. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But even in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. So on the Enterprise, Uhura reports they are supposed to return to Starfleet. And Chekhov says, we cannot leave, Captain. Let me try this again. Oh, yeah, God, do that. Because Dana, look, if he listens to this one, <laughs> actually, maybe you should do a real bad one. And he'll listen. He's like, oh, I'm going to be able to beat the shit out of this guy, you know, with my accent. And then you just you just slam him. It's like a whole WWF thing where you just jump in there. So Chekhov says, we cannot leave Captain Kirk and Dr. McCoy behind. Yeah, I mean, it depends on if he's having a good day or a bad day. I'm, you know. <laughs> so next we go to the trial on Kronos. And the judge is in the dark and he's got, but all we see is this like white beard and white hair uses like a ball gavel. It looks like it has a giant claw on it. And every time he hits it, there's sparks that go flying. Yeah. I liked it. I want one of those. Yeah. I mean, if I was up before a judge and he had something like that, I would be scared. Oh, yeah. Have you ever had to go in front of a judge for anything? Do you even want to tell if you have? <laughs> Just a traffic violation thing. Yeah, that's the only thing I had to do, too. Yeah, and it's funny. This kid got up before me, 17, 18 years old or something, Yeah, and had missed his previous appointment. Oh, boy. And the kid's wearing a hat and torn up jeans and looks like he just rolled out of bed. Yeah. And the judge says, take off your hat, and the kid doesn't do it. He's like, I said, take off your hat or I'll hold you in contempt of court. And the kid's like looking around like, who's he talking to? <laughs> so, <laughs> So he finally takes his hat off. The judge says, well, why didn't you make your first appointment? And he's like, oh, I overslept. This this kid was just stupid. Yeah. And the judge just kept saying, you know, well, you're going to get a chance to, you know, sleep in more because you're not going to be driving for, you know, the next six months. I'm revoking your license. Wow. And the kid goes, what do you mean you're revoking my license? <laughs> and the judge goes... <laughs> Bam! Slams the gavel down and says, contempt of court, that's $50 or whatever it was. Yeah. And, and the kid's like, you know, you can't do that. And he goes, bam! <laughs> and $50. <laughs> and it's like, and the lawyer, you know, because they have all these court-appointed lawyers like just hanging out in there, walks over to him and says, shut 
up. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, you're going to walk out of here with no money. <laughs> he goes, and you'll probably go to jail. <laughs> and I was like sitting like one row behind this kid. And I was like trying to distance myself, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know who he is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I got up and when it was my turn, it's like, yes, your honor. Yes, your honor. I made a mistake, your honor. I don't know that fucking kid. I have no clue who he is. Give me the word. I'll go kick his ass. You know, but... <laughs> I'll, I'll take his hat off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, you got to realize, you know, I mean, these, some people think that they are above the law. Like they can, you know, do whatever they want, that the, the court system is designed for us to be able to make fun of or something. I don't know, yeah. but uh, I've always been told to be respectful of the court system. And if you're ever in front of a judge, to be even more respectful. I have kind of a similar experience. I had to go to traffic court in Chicago. So I got to go to court, like whenever the court date is, it is packed. Traffic court in Chicago was jam packed. Like they would have hundreds of people in the courtroom. And so judge calls up the first person. Were you speeding? No, guilty, you know. <laughs> Comes up the next person we're speeding. No, guilty. <laughs> anyway, so he finds like the first three, four, five people. And then he says, okay, everyone who is going between one mile over the limit and eight miles over the limit, stand up. Why those two numbers? I got no idea. <laughs> and why someone get pulled over for one mile over the limit? Uh, that's also kind of crazy. So we all stand up and there's got to be, I don't know, 70 of us. And he's like, okay, do any of you here really want to plead not guilty? <laughs> and this one woman raises her hand and he says, yes. And she says, yeah, I was not guilty. He had just found all those other people, like those first four or five people guilty. Do you really want to plead not guilty? Do you really want to do that? And she said, yes, I want to plead not guilty. He said, okay, let's set a trial date. He says then to the rest of us, all right, I'm going to let all of you go. That woman must have been like, son of a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and my big mouth, yeah. He said, I'm going to let all of you go with a warning. And if you think you got away with something here today... I'm guess, I guess I'll see you again in the future. And as I'm walking out of there, I was like, yeah, I think I think I got away with something. I really, <laughs> I was speeding. Never got caught for speeding again. Got caught. So Chang relays the previous events to the spectators about what happened that night. Chang questions McCoy and says, when you found Chancellor Gorkin, was he alive? And McCoy says, barely. And Chang says, you couldn't save him because you're old and incompetent. And probably drunk. <laughs> McCoy goes to argue and says that he was desperate to save Gorkin, but basically no one hears him. Yeah, but how, how could you argue with that? I mean, it was it was true. All those things you said <laughs> were true, Dana. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's drunk and then there's slightly drunk and then there's like, you know, really inebriated. And incompetent. I mean, regardless if you're drunk or not, <laughs> that's, that one's obvious. Yeah, it was great. I mean, the way he went through the questions and McCoy just, you know, was kind of like, no, I, you know, he's like, I've been a Starfleet officer for 27 years or whatever it is, 37 years. And Chang says, well, why didn't you save Miramani? Remember her? <laughs> Talk about incompetent. <laughs> Kirk leans over. Why? Yeah. Why didn't you save her? So when Chang questions Kirk, he calls him the architect of the assassination. He then plays Kirk's log about never trusting the Klingons for killing his boy. I don't really trust them. the Klingon. <laughs> you hear this like splashy sound. <laughs> Boy, talk about Klingon. That thing clung on for a while. <laughs> so Chang keeps attacking Kirk and Chang says, as captain, you are ultimately responsible for the actions of your crew. And Kirk finally agrees that he is responsible for the crew under his command. So so hold on, hold on a second now, Dana. Hold on, hold on. You're the captain of this podcast. <laughs> okay. While I'm on the podcast, I believe I'm part of your crew. Remember, your rank, your rank is higher nope, than mine. Nope, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> the captain is in charge of the ship, okay? So you are responsible for anything I end up putting in this podcast episode. Well, and then the movie was over again. <laughs> <laughs> Like if the Cosby people finally get a hold of us, you're you're the guy. But you're the supreme vice admiral, which is higher than a captain. Hey, we're an LLC. We we can get away with anything. <laughs> I've said it before. I'll say it again. Because you don't you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's best not to know these the, like the ins and outs of these things. You know. 
So the judge finds them guilty as charged, bangs his gavel again, yeah, and says they'll be sent to a penal asteroid lithium mine. A what asteroid? Penal. Penal. Okay. Like a penal colony, but it's a penal asteroid. Oh, okay. So on the Enterprise, Spock asks to see the torpedo hit on the Klingon ship again, and we see it, and Chekhov says, it is Enterprise. And Scotty says, impossible. And Spock mentions the neutron surge, and he says, a ship near us possibly beneath us. So Spock orders a search of the ship to find the gravity boots worn by the assassins. We go to the asteroid where Kirk and McCoy are being taken. Kirk goes through a whole bunch of aliens, see all these different alien types, and a big alien picks up Kirk and speaks to him in an alien language, and a woman walks up with, she's got kind of like these bright yellow eyes. Yeah. She informs Kirk and McCoy that there is a price on their heads. Well, more on Kirk said. McCoy, people can do it for free. They're just going <laughs> to... <Yeah. laughs> We're willing to just take this guy out. <laughs> if he says one more time some stupid Southern saying, he <laughs> is going to just get destroyed. On the Enterprise, they're looking for the boots. Yeah. Spock is certain the boots are still on the ship and will lead them to the assassins. Back on the asteroid, Kirk is fighting a blue-faced, really ugly alien and losing. Oh, yeah. I mean, the guy's kicking his ass. Kirk gets beaten down by the alien. He's thrown around. He gets thrown over a fire. Yeah, but didn't catch on fire. So Kirk is down on his back, and the alien approaches him, and Kirk kicks out at his knees, and the alien, like, goes, <laughs> and gets this, like, really hurt look on his face. Yeah. And finally he drops. And Martia, she comes up and says, uh, not everybody's genitals are in the same place but he thought it was his knee so then she asks if kirk wanted to get out and kirk says yes there's there's got to be a way later kirk and mccoy are in their bunks so Martia comes up and she's like leaning on kirk's chest pretty much she says no one has ever escaped she says is it possible and she tells him getting outside the shield is easy but getting off the surface and kirk says it is possible and then she kisses him and mccoy sees this and kirk <laughs> just kind of like rolls his eyes and drops back in his bed and then she tells kirk where to meet her and kirk agrees mccoy sits up and says what is it with you anyway <laughs> this was the only time i can remember in any of the movies or the series where one of the other characters calls out kirk for his kind of like womanizing or ways lothario -ness. yeah yeah on the Excelsior, Sulu is sleeping when his door opens and shines a light on his face. A crewman tells him that Starfleet is asking for their help locating the Enterprise. And Sulu says, tell Starfleet we have no idea where the Enterprise is. And the crewman says, sir? And Sulu says, you have a hearing problem, mister? <laughs> And the crewman says no and leaves, and uh, Sulu lays back down. I was thinking Sulu's quarters seemed awful small. Very small. I mean, he's the captain. And once again, someone just opens the door in the middle of the night. Got to put a lock on those doors. Got to, yeah. Well, Dana, what it reminded me of is cabin, actually. Did you ever see in some of these airports, they have these little sleeping pods that you can rent? Like, if you're going to have a kind of a longer layover and you get one of those sleeping pods? Yeah. As long as they were clean, because they're small, so they could get a little stank if, you know, you jam a couple people in there. <laughs> I think that's a brilliant idea. I would love to be able to do that and just go and fall asleep for a few hours. Do you think you could do that in an airport? If it's in a sleeping pod, because it'd be quiet, yeah. Back on the Enterprise, Chekhov finds some Pepto-Bismol on the floor near the transporter. But what, you know, wouldn't it have dried up and, like, been... I mean, blood turns very... Human blood turns very dark after it's been oxidized for a while, right? So, so it does not cling on blood? Doesn't that change color, you don't think? Apparently not. It was kind of dry, because they did, like, a sample of it. Oh, he tasted it. And he's like, oh, yeah, that lost kind of its Pepto-Bismol flavor. Kind of pepperminty, but not quite. Then like, oh, yeah, remember Pepto-Bismol also comes in those little... Lozenges. Yeah. Which are worse than the liquid. Yeah. Oh, it's, they're horrible. They like they, You get them in your mouth and they, like stick all over your mouth and then it almost makes your mouth kind of super dry and... Yeah, and they're chalky. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very bad. Pepto-Bismol will never be a sponsor of this show. So. Never. <laughs> no, they never would be. No. Tums, on the other hand, might be. <laughs> yeah. I do like the tropical flavor Tums. Oh, and by the way, generic Tums, no. It's just chalk. It's just they, bu they bought a bunch of chalk. They sliced them into what looks like little tablets, and then that's it. That, but they're, oh, that stuff's horrible, Dana. The generic stuff? No. Not good. Anyone needs any, like, antacid uh, advice? <laughs> Just call the Damn It Jim hotline.
and we will help you out. The worst, though, Dana, the worst, Maalox. Oh, my God. Kaopectate. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever had that. Was that bad, too? A, a cousin to Maalox. Yeah, it's uh, without the flavoring. Yeah. Oh, and the flavoring in Maalox is horrible. Yeah. I mean, that's the only thing that makes it partly drinkable. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're giving heartburn to our listeners right now. We'll probably just finish. Let's just finish. <laughs> On the asteroid, Kirk and McCoy are following Martia, and they walk out across a barren wasteland of snow and hills. So on the Enterprise, they see Kirk and McCoy, and they say they're nearly outside the shield. So we see the Enterprise speeding through Klingon space. There's an outpost sees the Enterprise speeding through and asks who it is. On the Enterprise, they're scrambling to figure out how to respond. Oh, it was a Klingon outpost, yeah? Did I say Romulan? Uh, well, you may have said something, but again, Dana, there's something going on with my brain because I, you talk and sometimes I guess my brain just doesn't register that you're saying anything. <laughs> I just don't think you said anything, did you? I just thought, I thought you just said an outpost. They've got these like old books out, they, like check off and her are flipping pages through the books and they're... They're trying to figure out how to respond. Finally, Uhura says they are a freighter, and she keeps struggling to communicate. But the whole thing is like, the way they explain it is they say the Klingons will know if they're using a universal translator, and they're trying to trick the Klingons into thinking, I guess they're also Klingon? Yeah. I mean, it'd be like us trying to trick Russians into thinking we're Russian, trying to use the Chekhov accent. (laughs) It just just wouldn't work, Dana. On the asteroid, Marcia is, says uh, she is a chameleoid. And K- Kirk says, I thought shapeshifters were mythical. And then she says, we're outside the shield now. And Kirk stands up and punches her, knocking her down. Yeah, I mean, right in the face. And he says, she didn't need our help getting anywhere. Where did she get these convenient clothes? And he says, uh, ask her what she's getting in return. And she says, a full pardon. So Marcia turns into Kirk and she knocks McCoy out. And Kirk says, I can't believe I kissed you. And Marcia replies, it must have been your lifelong ambition. <laughs> <laughs> like he's kissing himself. Was that kind of the insinuation there? Yeah. They continue fighting and they, you know, roll around the ground. They actually roll across McCoy. Then all of a sudden they see they're surrounded by guards. And the warden guy comes up and the two Kirk say, shoot him, shoot him. And the warden guy picks the right one and shoots Marsha. And Kirk says, who wanted us dead? And the warden is just about to say when Kirk and McCoy get beamed up. But I mean, I think at this point, it's pretty obvious who wants them dead. Spock. It's Spock. Spock and, <laughs> Spock and Scotty want both of these guys dead. Check off a new hurrah and mostly Sulu, but uh, yeah. Yeah, the whole original <laughs> crew definitely wants, maybe not so much McCoy, but they definitely want Kirk dead. Yeah, they're they're fed up with him at this point. So so we see Scotty in the conference room. He's looking at something with the Enterprise. And he appears to be feeling hot. He keeps like tugging at his collar. He gets off and goes to the vent and finds gear shoved inside. And he pulls out the gear and we can kind of see it's like the gear that the assassins wore. Dumb place to hide it, Dana. Come on. So we see the warden telling someone that they escaped in a Federation vessel. And then we see he's talking to Chang. And so they order an intercept course for the Enterprise. On the Enterprise, Kirk learns that the conference location is kept secret, just as they find the two men whose gear Scotty had found. And they were killed by phaser on stun at close range. We see like bruise marks on their forehead. Then there's an announcement over the intercom for the court reporter to report to sickbay to take statements. Then we see someone enter sickbay, and sickbay is dark. And as the person approaches, Spock reaches up and turns the light on. And we see Valeris is standing over him with a phaser. Ooh, that that actually was a bit of a twist right there. Yeah. And then he knocks the phaser out of her hand pretty violently. I was hoping he was going to slap her, really, to be honest, Dana. I wanted one last mabinga. So next we see Valeris is on the bridge as Spock and Kirk question her in front of the bridge crew. And Kirk is stunned. And Spock grabs her and turns her towards him. And he looks really angry. And she tries to avoid him. And he does the Vulcan mind meld with her. And they're, they're asking, you know, give us the names. And Spock says, Admiral Cartwright. And then she starts saying, along with Spock, General Chang, the Romulan ambassador. So then we see the Enterprise speeding on. Then we go to the peace conference as the president of the Federation begins by welcoming everyone. We go back to the bird of prey as it cloaks. 
Kirk and crew are watching for the bird of prey. Then Chang fires, Enterprise is rocked. So then we see the Excelsior speeding in. At the peace conference, we see a Klingon with a bulky attache case stand up and leave the center. That's not suspicious at all. No, I was going to say, who would even notice such a thing? So there was an assassination. Yeah. So you would think the security would be beefed up. This guy can just walk in with a suitcase that has all this Klingon writing on the side of it, which probably says something like, big gun inside. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't check it. They don't x-ray it. I mean, come on. Yeah, maybe they just thought he was going on a trip. So back in the Enterprise, Chang fires again. The Enterprise is hit hard and rocked. Sparks fly and the lights go out. Then Spock says, gas. And Kirk says, it's not me, it's Uhura. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Spock says, even under impulse power, they have to expel gas. And Uhura points out that they have all this equipment on board for investigating gaseous anomalies. Oh, so now it ties all back together. And they, they did mention that at the beginning of the movie. The very beginning. So the Enterprise is hit again. Scotty says, the shields are weakening. And Sulu approaches and says, now we've given them something else to shoot at. So Chang fires at the Excelsior. And Chang seems thrilled and says, cry havoc and let slip the dogs of war. It's from Julius Caesar, right? I'd be willing to bet that's Richard the Third. Well, we'll look it up. We'll look it up while you keep talking. I'll. Uh, I'm going to tell you it's Julius Caesar anyway. <laughs> So we're now we're switching back and forth between Spock and McCoy readying the torpedo peace conference. Then we go to Chang's ship. So finally they get the torpedo ready and they fire from Chang's ship. They see this coming towards them. Chang stands up and says to be or not to be. And the torpedo hits and there's an explosion. And Sulu says, target that explosion and fire. And the Excelsior fires and Kirk yells, fire! The Enterprise fires and they blow up the Klingon ship. That, that was great. I actually like that scene a lot. It is Julius Caesar. Mark Antony says it. Act 3, scene 1, line 273 of Julius Caesar. It's uh, my horse. My horse, my kingdom for a horse. That's from Richard III. So then we see the assassin at the conference readying his gun to shoot. The crew beams down. Kirk sends Scotty off in one direction as Kirk charges the podium. And he jumps and tackles the president just as the Klingon fires. And the assassin focuses in now on Valaris when Scotty bursts into the room and fires, knocking the Klingon through the glass down on the floor below. So the Klingon chancellor's daughter steps up and demands to know what's happened. What do you mean what's happened? <laughs> were you not awake during this part like i'm often not awake during the movie did you not just see what happened so everyone starts clapping so on the enterprise so this is later sulu appears on the monitor and says nice to see you in action one more time and uh, then he says take care captain kirk then uhura sa says uh we're supposed to report back to space dock to be decommissioned and there's like a pause and then spock says if i were human i believe my response would be go to hell and Chekhov says course heading captain that might have been my best one ever could be right at the end yeah so Kirk sits down in his chair and looks at the screen, and then he points and says, second star to the right, and straight on till morning. Everyone smiles. We get the final captain's log. Right there on the bridge. Right on the bridge, <laughs> Danny's like, well, look, the ship's going to get decommissioned. So if there's a little mess here, it's not, no, not a problem. Yeah, it's going to be more than a little mess, I think. So. <laughs> Says USS Enterprise, Stardate 9529.1. This is the final cruise of the Starship Enterprise under my command. This ship and her history will shortly become the care of another crew. To them and their posterity, I leave this log on the bridge. <laughs> will we commit our future? Oh, that's what it was. Okay. <laughs> The ship goes off into the light. We see the cast names in signature form. A nice finish, Dan. That's how the movie ends. So, Dana, you have some information to share with us about some people in this film. Yeah, Dan. Well, for starters, according to William Shatner's uh, Star Trek Memories, Gene Roddenberry saw this movie just two days before he died. And that's what killed him? Or what, what, what are you saying? <laughs> 
After seeing the film, Roddenberry gave thumbs up all around and then went back and phoned his lawyer, angrily demanding a full quarter hour of the film's more militaristic moments be removed from the film. So he's dying. He's on his deathbed, essentially. And he's going to sue somebody. Yeah, <laughs> about- the studio. My God. And then he, you know, of course he died before the, the lawyer could present his demands to the studio. Yeah, the lawyer killed him. Let's face it. The, this, yeah. the lawyer's like, ah, we're not doing this. Good luck. Get a new lawyer. Uh, get a new client because he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dan, also, uh, Valeris was played by Kim Cottrell. She was actually originally offered the role of Savick in Wrath of Khan. Oh, wow. She had a scheduling conflict, so she wasn't able to fulfill the contract at that point. She has a long TV career showing up in everything from The Incredible Hulk to Nancy Drew Mysteries. Other film roles include the cult classic Porky's and one of my favorites, Big Trouble in Little China. And she's still alive. Dan, she's only 67. Yeah, we could definitely get her on the show. I think uh, we're better with somebody senile getting them on the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, now that you say that, yeah. Or someone dead even might be easier, you know. <laughs> also, Dan, uh, Christopher Plummer played Chang. Yeah. Uh, very distinguished actor known for his roles in movies like The Sound of Music, your favorite, Dolores Claiborne, uh, the movie Dreamscape, Somewhere in Time, and a personal favorite of mine, The Silent Partner. Many often referred to him as the finest actor of the post-World War II era. Sadly, he passed away in 2021, Dan. Yeah, we could definitely get him on, too. <laughs> we got to do the seance, Dana. We really do. Yeah, well, you were in charge of finding the seance I know. Gosh, I, I know. I just got a little busy. Seems like a medium problem to me. <laughs> so, Dan, do you have some other things you want to share with us about the film? I do a few things, Dana. So this movie is the first instance of Sulu's first name, Hikaru which is Japanese for shining, being stated. So prior to this film, it was commonly used in the novels and reportedly approved by Gene Roddenberry and George Takei, but had never been made official. So when it's said in the movie, this is like the first official time that we hear it. The film confirms Kirk's middle name also, which had been previously established in the animated series as Tiberius, but this is the first time in a live action production. And then remember when Sulu gets woken up on the Excelsior? Well, it was actually supposed to be Rand, Yeoman Rand to inform him that Starfleet was looking for the Enterprise. But it's Christian Slater. Yeah. He was a huge fan of Star Trek, though. The way he got in the movie was his mother was the casting director. (laughs) It's not what you know, Dan. It's who you know. But anyway, Dan, that's all I have. Dan, so uh, last film, do you have any themes or dilemmas to discuss about this? What I saw is the dilemma of how can we achieve lasting peace? And is it possible to overcome our prejudices in order to live harmoniously with those that we have seen as enemies? So that really begs the question, as a human race, will we ever be able to get over that? Uh, I hope the answer is yes. How about the dilemma for you, Dana? Uh, Very similar, Dan, to be able to rise above prejudice and fear. Especially for Kirk. I think that was uh, a big dilemma for him. Dana, how about the best part of the film for you? Dan, I love seeing Sulu as captain of the Excelsior. And I thought he was great in that role. Do you have a best part? I really like the ending of the film. And I thought it was a great way to end the series of movies and the entire original series franchise with the original crew. How about another best part for you? Uh, The mystery that goes on throughout this and uh, it's carried off well. The the whole... uh assassination attempt at the end is kind of taken a little bit from Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much and, and other films have copied it as well. Thought they did a nice job with it all. I, and then, you know, they used the whole crew to to help out and I, I like the way they did that. Do you have another best part for us, Dan? Kind of echoing a little bit what you said, I think each crew member had a really meaningful role in this film. How about another best part for you? The fast pacing at the end, you know, the last like 20 minutes of the film, all those edits, all that, you know, just helps build up the tension. And I thought they did a great job with that. Do you have any more best parts, Dan? Shatner was not the director of this movie. (laughs) Dana, how about a worst part for you? Dan Valeris kind of bugged me. She didn't act Vulcan. It just, she was uneven as far as Vulcans go. Do you have a worse part for us, Dan? I mean, for me, Dana, the series and the movies with the original crew come to an end. I mean, never to travel the stars again. How about for you? Another worst part. I, I love uh, Christopher Plummer as an actor, 
But I tell you, the constant quoting of Shakespeare by the Klingons just got on my nerves. It was just getting to be too much. Just let it go. Well, Dana, you know, I mean, life's but a waking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. (laughs) Well said, Shakespeare. (laughs) Dan, do you have another worst part for us? The translation scene. Well, I think on one level it was kind of humorous, but I mean, don't they have a computer that like has Google Translate on the freaking thing? You know, (laughs) Dana, what happened on this day in history? Dan, the film was released December 6th, 1991. And at the time, uh, number one song in the U.S. was Black or White by Michael Jackson. And in the U.K., the number one song was Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me with George Michael and Elton John. Also on December 6th, uh, Yugoslav war in Croatia. Forces the forces of the Serb-dominated Yugoslav People's Army conduct the heaviest bombardment of Dubrovnikov, <laughs> Dubrovnik, <laughs> During the siege of seven months. Well, I remember the whole Serb-Croatia thing. That went on for years, Dana. Yeah, didn't it? Yeah. Also, December 3rd, Hulk Hogan, another relative of Dan's, defeats (laughs) The Undertaker at the... Tuesday in Texas at the Freeman Coliseum in San San (laughs) Otegio. In San Antonio to become the four-time WWF champion. December 8th, Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine form Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, December 9th, the second Billboard Music Awards, Michael Jackson, Billy Ray Sias, Boys to Men, and U2 all were winners. And finally... Just for you, Dan, December 14th, ferry boat Salem Express sinks in the Red Sea, 476 killed. Wasn't the Red Sea before that accident, though? Sharks, shark joke. Are there sharks in the Red Sea? I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, the Red Sea is home to 44 species of sharks, including 20 that are unique to the region. Wow. Hammerhead sharks, tiger sharks, leopard sharks, reef sharks, and a bunch of others. Dana, we're done with all the films with the original crew. Right? Yeah. What did you think of this one, especially as the last film? I mean, they're all older. It seemed appropriate that this be the last film. I would have kind of cringed if they tried another one. But uh, it's a good movie. It's not the best of the best, but I think it's good. It's a solid movie. It's got adventure. It's got fun. It's got some great lines by the characters. And it's it seemed appropriate that they ended with an attempt to saving the Klingons. And maybe the first movie where Kirk actually has an arc yeah, I mean, he, he changes from one point to the other. I, I thought that was classic. And then finishing with the crew's signature, I just thought it was a classy and cool way to send off the original series cast. I remember in the theater just like clapping so loud. I thought it was a great ending. How about you, Dan? As the last film, what do you think? I agree with everything you said, Dana. And the other thing that I really liked about this movie was the geopolitical stuff going on, especially at the time the movie came out, the Soviet Union, you know, was just on the verge of collapse. In fact, in August of 91, I was in the Soviet Union visiting when the coup against Gorbachev happened. He was the leader of the Soviet Union. And this was going on probably while the film was, you know, being written. And so I really like how they took very current events and incorporated what they knew into the film at the time. Anyway, I really like that part of it. I also like the send-off at the end where Kirk says, that second star on the right and go on till morning or whatever the exact quote is. I thought it was sentimental, but not schlocky. So Dana, we've got a little bit of change in the next few weeks. Yes, one of us does. (laughs) Mostly because... (laughs) So as, as our listeners probably know, I'm studying for this advanced Cicerone exam. It's kind of like a beer expert exam. And I really just have to take the next several weeks to just be on all the studying. I really want to try to do my best. So I need to try to cram as much stuff into my head in the next few weeks as possible. And so we are going to take some time off, Dana. So Dana, between now... And the middle of September, we're going to do some Encore episodes. Dan, as a bit of a teaser, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but uh, we will do the uh, Star Trek Generations film. And then after that, we will probably do a complete wrap up of all the movies. Yep. Sounds great, Dana. Well, hey, enjoy the rest of your week this week, and I will see you in about five weeks. Wow. It sounds like you're breaking up with me. Thanks again for everybody who writes in and calls. Uh, And once again, 
Dan, what is that phone number? The Damn It Jim hotline is 509-676-6298. If you didn't have a chance to write that down, it will be in the show notes. We really appreciate all the communications we get from our loyal friends. We don't think we have fans. We have friends. Thanks once again for following us through this venture, and we'll keep you posted on what's coming up. Meanwhile, let's cheer on Dan so he uh, passes this uh, next test and becomes more insufferable about the beer that he likes. (laughs) (laughs) You're not the first person who said that, Dana. (laughs) And won't be the last. (laughs) Until we meet again, live long and prosper. Thanks once again for listening to Damn It Jim, the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at dammitjimpodcast at gmail.com or join the discussion on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or X. You can also call the Dammit Jim hotline at 509-676-6298. Enjoy the rest of your week, and as always, remember to live long and prosper. This has been a Ramble Jar production.